so today we are um, entering into a whole new section of JavaScript for R. Um, so we're working through the book JavaScript for R by John Cohn um, as part of the R for Data Science Slack community. Um, the videos are all stored on YouTube. And um, so if anyone's watching online and would like to join us, this is, you know, the start of August 2022. If you want to join us live for the um, meetings, you're welcome to. Um, just join the Slack community and search out our little book club channel. Um, yes, so this is a new section of the book where we're talking about communicating from an R process to JavaScript in the browser and then communicating back from JavaScript to R. So it's like a kind of bi-directional feedback of data going one way and, and the other. Whereas the, the previous section, we were writing code that uses JavaScript libraries, but you're using them from an R perspective and you're just sending data from R to JavaScript. Um, so now we're closing the loop and coming back from JavaScript. And Lucio is going to be taking us through his um, uh, notes on this chapter. Um, so if do, do you have a screen share you'd like to do? Brilliant, brilliant. OK, thanks. So yeah, what we're going to do is explore how Shiny, this package, allows us to send, uh, sorry, to communicate the R language and, uh, and JavaScript, specifically via the R server and the user interface. Also, we are going to see a couple of examples of how to include JavaScript code into a Shiny app. So all over this chapter, there are many, many Shiny applications, Shiny applications that, the, that will be created. So I have sent, or, or per, perhaps let me send it again, because Ryan just joined. Uh, I sent the, the R Markdown file corresponding to this chapter so that you can also follow along with the, with the code if necessary, because I made some changes to the code presented in the chapter, especially in the last section, uh, the section JavaScript to R. I, I didn't really, I really wasn't a fan of, of the example provided in the book. So I made another one. Okay, so this section, it's called WebSocket and Shiny. Um, maybe not, maybe let's not worry about the formal definition of the WebSocket, but Let's think about what it will allow us to do, to do, and that will be a persistent connection between the main components of the Shiny app, which are the user interface, that is uh, what we can see in the browser, uh, those objects that the user can interact with. It's also referenced as a UI. And the other main component is the server function, which, I mean, whose role is mainly uh, to provide the logic for how the, the content of the, of the application, of the user interface, uh, should, up, should upload, no, sorry, should uh, update uh, as, a consequence, as a consequence of the interactions that the user is making with the page, maybe like modifying some inputs or things like that. So yes, yeah, so there is, there is this diagram in the book of how the WebSocket is what allows us to communicate the R server and well, and the browser. Uh, so in this way, this rectangle over here, R server represents uh, the R language that we are going to be using and the browser represents the, Java, the JavaScript code that we're, we're going to be writing in the following parts. Also, Mm, yeah, so the, in the book, they mention a, a little example of how this bidirectional communication work works. So I, I will just copy this code and run it in a R script in order to see the, the app. And the only thing that it, it is doing, it provides us a text to, to write. 
and then it prints it prints in the in the user interface in the web page in the web page that we are seeing it prints the text that we have just we have just typed it and so even in this simple application how we see that the web socket is working like this right we have uh, let's see, we start over here in this text input, this region over here where we can write, and the WebSocket uh, it allows us to send uh, the value of this inside this inside this text input that is the string that I am writing over here, and then giving that value, it it has a way for the R server to to make some changes to that code. And then the output of that code that we can see over here, it is simply reading that text that I have just typed. The output of that code, this function, um, it will transform that output into the appropriate HTML code so that we can see the result in the, in the user interface, in the page. In this case, the only transformation that it is doing is uh, convert this string into, into its literal form for the HTML page. So like almost literally printing it, like we can see over here. And, and again, no, there was, this was a one-way communication from the user interface to the R server. And then the last part, now from the R server to the user interface, uh, when we pass the HTML code so that the user interface can be updated. In this case, in this case, updated via this text that is being printed. As we can see. Okay, so the web, the web socket is a bridge between our server and the user interface. And can, as, um, Lucio, can yeah. I ask, um, do, so is it, is there a single WebSocket in play there? Is is the WebSocket from the server to the UI different from the one that goes from the UI to the server, or is it the same entity and there's just a, a, a the the information can flow both ways via it? Hmm. I don't really know. But from what I read about what is a WebSocket, it mentioned that it was a, a sort of connection. So I would imagine that it is the same mm. back okay. and forth. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Russ, if you don't mind me jumping mm. in real quick yeah, of course, of course. to do a comment related to this, and, and Arthur, feel welcome to, to throw your thoughts in, in as well. In the concept of threading, web sockets, et cetera, the, the thing you want to remember is the networking stack as a whole, right? The ISO stack as a whole. All of your HTML and HTTP exchange going back and forth, it's not HTML, that's just the language, but the HTTP uh, protocol, that's it like layers seven, uh, six and seven, right? So, so it's way, way, way high up on the stack. There's a whole level of interaction that is occurring at you know layers four, layers three, layers two, that we need to take into account to establish the definition of what a WebSocket is. And the, the thing that I, I, I wanna convey to Lucio, and, and I appreciate your explanation, almost to a, to a point where if you were to create the Shiny IO website, as an example, and interact with that from your rendered code or your access to the server, include the network as a component within this WebSocket creation because it's vital to comprehend. If we're only doing this from a local server, okay, we run, you know, Shiny app, uh, run Shiny app and, you know, everything constructs into the browser to your local machine. And you, you can see what, what Lucio is doing with the, with the previous uh, text input. That's great. But actually, the technology that we need to access in the definition of what a WebSocket is, is at that networking layer, you know, application layer type mindset. And it is ECMA and it is all related to um, how this communication is, is exchanging. I would almost extend to the comment to Russ your question of, is it only one socket? I would say, no, probably not. 
because there's a huge quantity of different exchanges that are happening between server and, and browser. Does that help at all? I don't have any evidence of my claim, so I want to be careful that I'm not trying to just yeah, throw yeah, in no, two makes, cents. But uh, that's fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Multi-threading is key. See, this, yeah. this book, I'm learning one level lower than I currently understand in Shiny, and 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 the web sockets are a layer below that already. So I'm I'm just kind of getting a bit more uh, knowledge. Lucia, please uh, continue with your thing. Sorry for my button in, but uh, yes, it's going, it's going good. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. You think I didn't know about uh, the WebSocket like, like formally. Uh, so the next section in the in this chapter is called sessions. And um, as we can see in the in the picture, in the previous picture that was here, Every time that uh, a user is running some Shiny app, uh, there is a unique identifier that it, it is provided to that user. Uh, so that, for example, if two users are, run, are running the same Shiny app, for example, maybe some app that it is hosted online, maybe it's through Shiny apps that you, uh, this unique identifier uh, for the people, for the user running the app, it allows us, it allows us that so that if one user, say user A, makes some changes to some input in this, uh, in this app, the updates that will occur to the application, to the user interface, those updates should not interfere with the version of the app, of the same app that a user B is seeing, maybe his computer or his local screen. So every time that one person connects to, the, to a shiny app, there is there is this unique identifier that it is created for him and it is called a session also this session is with it will it will allow us to send data from the r server to well to the user interface let's say from r to javascript and so in the book dimension for example right that shiny isolates its users into what it refers to as session, like we saw in this picture, they are isolated. Um, yeah, I already mentioned this. Okay, so now how to use that session in order to send data from R to JavaScript. So the book uh, provides an example via a JavaScript library named JBooks. Uh, it will allow us to to print some kind of alert messages, but with um, with more interactivity and with uh, with more complex styling also. Say if I were to 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 execute this code into the browser console, well by, by typing control shift J, there is this pop-up win pop-up window with the message that I have provided. So this library works almost in a similar way. It just, in, we can think of it just like prettier boxes, pretty alert boxes. Okay, so then they provide a, how to load this JavaScript library into a Shiny app. And they also show an example, right? Like, how does these boxes look? But I added this part because in the following code, I, I, I add a little bit of, of code in order to, to demonstrate a couple more features that the JBox library has, especially because we are going to focus in the next section in, in this, this part of what to do or what, what we want JavaScript to do whenever one of these boxes that we are going to create with this library, one of these boxes closes. Okay, so let's let's run this up. It, would, it will simply, over here, it loads the dependencies for the JBox JavaScript library. And then over here, they are going to create one of those boxes, a type of box, a, a type set to notice, and the content of that box, it will be this message. 
this I will, I will explain later, later what? Later, so let me open it in the browser to have access to the console more easily. Okay, so this is the message. This is the output produced by this code that we wrote over here. New JBox notice, and then the, the message that we want in that, in that box. Say I were, I were to write again that, uh, that code and it shows this notice and as I click on it, it will close. Now the following part, uh, I added, I added over here, this title, you can see over here, it's per in JBox. And I, I give it a, a unique identifier so that we can explore only quickly a couple more properties that the JBox library provides. So now I will run this code into the browser console. And it, it is doing right. So it looks for this element that has an identifier title. It is exactly this one that I have defined over here. As you can see here, this is its ID. And then it does, well, a, a, a couple more things. Let's see. I click on this title and this, this box shows up. And when I click again, there is this box that of different color. So how how does how does one create those boxes via this section? For example, over here, it is said to the well to JavaScript what to do whenever this box is closed. It well it creates this box that we saw in red with this content see ya later. I click again and it is being closed. So it creates this. Okay, so the main part is that we have a way to execute some, func some function whenever this pop-up box uh, is closed. This, this will be useful later, later. And so now we can, we can do our first example, at least in this book, of how to send data from R to JavaScript. So from the R server to the user interface. And our goal will be to modify the message that we have when, when this box appears. Modify it in the, in the usual way via some inputs that we can use via Shiny. We, we define such inputs in the user interface. And what we will do to send data from the R server to the user interface is uh, make use of this session object. This session object is unique to each user that is running the app. And also the method or, or the function associated with this object. And such function is called send comes to message. Okay, so here's an example. Now they are including the session uh, for the server function. And what we are doing over here is we, we define two parameters. First, the parameter type, it could be an identifier so that JavaScript can, let's say, catch, so that whenever it catches that, uh, you, that event, that identifier, it executes some code. And also uh, the second argument of this function, it will be a message. And here the content will be the data that we want to send to JavaScript. So if I were to include this piece of code over here, so like redefining what the server is doing, it is already sending data from R to JavaScript, but we can't still see the changes. Like it looks exactly the same as, the, uh, as before. So now we have sent the, the, data, the data from R to JavaScript. Uh, this data via this identifier. But now 
what we want to do now that JavaScript has that data that R is sending to it, we have to execute some JavaScript code. And we will do that using JavaScript shiny object and its method uh, at custom message handler. So it also has this function over here, two arguments. One, the type argument is a identifier that we have provided over here so that because those identifiers match, it knows that once this data is given, now what to do with such data? We send the data message. So now we can define as a second parameter of this function, what we want JavaScript to do with such data that R is sent into JavaScript. In this case, uh, what JavaScript is doing is creating one of these pop-up boxes, like we can see here in gray. And the difference will be uh, the content of that, of that box. So like the string, the text. We can see that uh, that application over here. So let's just copy the code. Here is similar, they are simply loading the dependencies for this JBox library. And maybe first let's see in action and then explain a little bit of their components. Here we can write some text. And once we click on this button, uh, a JBox box appears. With the, with the message, sorry, with the input value that we have set here. And a little, a little information that R has done to such input value. Okay, so how is it doing that, right? Over here, the user, in the user interface, it first loads the JBox dependencies. Then we define this area over here so that the user can type some text and this button so that we know when to show the, the box, the, well, the JBox message. Now, well, before seeing this, the code uh, for JavaScript, let's see this part. Here we are defining that whenever uh, this value changes, uh, this value is, as, is the value of a button, so it means that whenever this button is pressed, what we want R to do is send a message, well, from R to JavaScript, the identifier of such message, let's say its name will be sent notice. And the data that we are sending to JavaScript with that message is simply the text that it is being input here. And in this case, it's example. But then it will add a couple exclamation signs. Now, we have defined it, uh, the identifier that of the message that we are sending from R to JavaScript. So now we have to tell JavaScript what to do now that the, the, the data is being sent to it. So we repeat over here, right? The same identifier now in this context of the shiny at cost, at custom message handler over here, same identifier. And now the function will be what we want to do with JavaScript, given that data. And over here, this is a data sent. And the data sent is a text input plus, well, concatenated with such exclamation signs. And such data will be the content of the box that we are, well, well that it is being displayed here on the right example concatenated with such characters. Over here, I added a little bit of code, only so that we can see, for example, over here we are passing, sorry, we are sending a string to JavaScript. But now that such data is in JavaScript, is it still a string or what happened to it? So I'll simply look in a, a, at such data and what type of data it is, if it is a string, an object, or what. 
So let's say example. And over here, this is the data that has been that has been sent from R to JavaScript, and it says that its type of of data is a JavaScript string. Okay. Uh, and, and then the the author uses his gram to diagram to explain what is going on. We have this text input, this box, and uh, as it changes value, so as we read something over here, such data is being sent from the client to a server. And in this, in this section, the server is doing some computation uh, to that value that has been sent. That is what we are doing over here. The only com computation is uh, a string concatenation. Then it is sending the R server uh, such, well, sorry, a message, some data to the user interface via this message handler that we have defined over here and here. And the last part, right, is now that you have the data in the client, in the browser, now what to do with such data? Um, this part show notice is exactly what we have defined over here, right? What to do with the data that R has sent from R to JavaScript. Huh. Okay, an interesting comment in the chat. Oh. Maybe, maybe like one question, Lucio. Um, well, first, like really nice presentation, um, <clears throat> super clear. One, I guess I have one, one question which maybe complicates things maybe unnecessarily at this stage, but I'm kind of wondering, like let's say I took the shiny stuff and I wrapped things in a module, how would I go about kind of bringing the namespace of the module to the JavaScript? Uh, I mean, I, I guess I just have to, prepend kind of the name the namespace to that because I I mean it looks like you know at least the way I'm kind of internalizing this 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 type argument is it's sort of like the sort of like the the, the ID uh, uh, of, of, of an element in, in, in the UI right um, and I'm, I'm wondering if I'm wondering how one would go about kind of wrap, wrapping this like let's say we made this into like a, a, a shiny module. I'm wondering how we would treat kind of JavaScript components that that have IDs to them. Maybe, maybe not a question for us to answer now, but it's just kind of a thought that bubbled to mind. Can I? Yeah, I, I can't really answer it. I, I don't know about any modules. Sorry. The, the, there are actually other um, methods associated with the session object. So the, there is one. We've talked about the send custom message, but there's also a send input message and um, uh, pre presumably several other things. So you, you can actually send um, messages to a component on the front end by its identifier, um, if I understand it correctly. Um, but yeah, there's 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 definitely the the trouble is that the session object has oh i can't even estimate at the moment um a couple of dozen different methods as far as i can see um and um yeah there's 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 definitely going to be a method in there for passing some data and binding it to a specific element, I think. Sorry, Russ or, or Lucio, I don't mean to keep hijacking with uh, throwing out uh, uh, message threads, uh, comments uh, that, that we're reading, chat windows that we're reading. But um, the Arthur, have we have we in the past talked about making namespace available in the shiny environment? I don't remember if that's been in a common book club between the two of us. No, Russ, 
uh, I'm, I'm searching frantically for my reference. I don't believe that's it. I don't mm. think it's in Mastering Shiny. I think We've it's in EPGS. we discussed namespacing. Yeah. Uh, it's it's in, the, in the Mastering Shiny modules, it, there chapter, is. which is towards the end of the book. It, it's, it's discussed in basically chapter one of Engineering Shiny. Um, it, because I, you need you need access to these yeah. to these named variables to interact with them or or to know awareness of where they're at. Otherwise, it's completely ephemeral. It's whatever the the uh, application wants to name them. But I'll see if I can find those references, Arthur, and, and forward them to you. Okay, so following with the the presentation, let's see. We were over here. Yeah, the next the next section was theorization. Um, it highlighted it highlighted that the data that we are giving to a, to this JBox object, sorry, to this JBox, and I know component. It, it essentially has a form of a JSON object. So this over here, right? And so this means that if we want to send a data from R to JavaScript, we can do we can use its analog version that R, ha, R has for this JSON object. Um, it will be a list. And we can see, for example, that over here, this JSON object that is being used as a parameter for the for the settings of this JBox, it looks exactly the same as if we were to we were to define over here a list in R, and then apply this code over uh, with respect to how such data is being serialized once it, it is being sent from from R to JavaScript. Uh, and this is the output. So yeah, it's basically the same. This transformation from R to, to JavaScript as we had over here. So now instead of just sending a string as we are doing over here, we are going to provide more settings and we're going to send those in the form of our, of our, our list. So over here, yeah, so over here, there, there is an example of doing that. So sending more settings. So let me rerun this app. This is same loading the dependencies for JBox. And now we're using the same identifier, same notice, but now given the data that R is sending to, to JavaScript, such data would be like this JSON object. Uh, for the settings of our JBox. So we only need to send, sorry, to, to execute this code to in order to, to generate uh, the box that we wanted. Okay. So uh, now on the other change, uh, now in the part of the server, uh, as I mentioned, now we are sending more, more the, well, not more data, more, more settings to this JBox, and we are sending it in the, in the form of an R list. We define the content of, sorry, the message, the text that will be uh, displayed in such box and the color of that box. And over here, we're simply uh, doing the, the shiny way to send data from R to JavaScript. Identifier and the message now is, sorry, the data being sent now is this list. So let's run the app. Um, uh, as the app is being initialized, it sends this message. And so give it this data that it will sent from R to JavaScript, it, it, it automatically, automatically executes this code. So it, as soon as we start the app, well, almost as soon as we start the Shiny app, it provides us with this notice JBox with this data that we have sent from R2 okay. Um
So that's one way. Also, that's, I think that's the easier way to do it uh, in this bi bidirectional communication that we are exploring. At, at least from, from I got from this chapter, it, it is that it, it's much more simple to send data from R to JavaScript than the other way around. So sending data from JavaScript to R. So um, the app that the, the, author, the author of the book propose, proposes, it's doing the following. Uh, once that these, uh, let me see. Okay. Once that this JBox uh, gets closed, for example, if I click on it, we want that there is some data that will be sent from JavaScript to R. Uh, and then do something with such data. The problem is that uh, the author, at least in the example that he provides for like for this section of sending data from JavaScript to R, he, he isn't really doing much with the data that it's being uh, with the data that it's being read from JavaScript, and also that. And what he's doing now that JavaScript is sending the data to R, he isn't really doing much also with the data sent. So of course uh, there is there is value in, in reading the example that the author provides, but I think that at least this one over here, uh, it's also useful. We're going to, to see it in a while. There's only a couple things to notice. How do we achieve this goal, right? Uh, how do we make that so that first uh, for JavaScript to detect when this JBox is closed, so when this happens, uh, and then once such event, no, once such event occurs, uh, how to let R know uh, about that? So here is the example that I had provided earlier. So. Over here we can see uh, how we can define uh, what we want JavaScript to do when this, this JBox uh, is being closed. It's, uh, it's only a matter of defining over here uh, in this JSON, in this JSON object of the settings for our box, uh, defining in this uh, well keeper for on close. A certain function. We, we could even like remove all of these. Here it will be a notice. Um, I think there is one argument missing. Yeah, the content. Content. Oh, we even really did it. So there was an empty box, but once that such empty box was closed, it executed its function. It creates a new box with this message and this color. Okay, so we, we will be using this. Uh, the way that the author proposes of how to, how to perform this operation send data from JavaScript to R, it will be but by defining a new input for the user interface, but not defining not defining it in the usual in the usual way, well the usual shiny way of doing things like I don't know something like text input and some ID or I don't know other other type of input layer input and another ID. But it will be creating such inputs directly from JavaScript uh, via this code. We define an input with this ID and we initialize it with a certain value. Now I will show the example. Okay, now I will show the example over here and explain what's going on. Uh, and the last part is. Now understand it, that's that application, but from this, maybe let's say perspective, 
that the author is that the author showed us before when we are sending data from R to JavaScript. So now that we are sending data from JavaScript to R, we can see that things have gotten a little bit messy. This was the case, a data being sent from R to JavaScript. And now, no, wait, no, that was, no, I think it was, oh, I don't know, I think this was the case. Well, but the other, the other thing is, I know it was over here, sorry. Here, now this was a diagram for when, when we are sending data from R to JavaScript, but now that we are going to send a data from JavaScript to R, the diagram, even though the app is pretty simple actually, looks like this. Okay, so what is the app? So what is it doing? Uh, how are we using this new input that we are defining to the user interface, but not via R, but via this JavaScript code? So let's see the app. Uh, similarly, we start by loading the JBox dependencies, uh, and then we we define what we want JavaScript to do once that. A certain data is being sent from R. And then we are defining this section uh, that it will be a text that says that says the encounter, but next to it there will be um, a number that keeps updating, uh, uh, adding one every time that a second passes. Uh, and then we um, let me, maybe let's just show you that and then explain. I think it's much simpler that way. Okay, so the app starts and if in this section, as soon as it starts, it starts counting the seconds that have passed. And once I click in this button, it shows me this day box, uh, box. And now once I click, uh, once such a box closes, it sends a, uh, it executes some, sorry, it sends some data to R and then R executes some code. And what it's doing such R code is simply printing what's the value uh, of how many time have passed in seconds uh, since I, no, at the moment that such J box rectangle was closed. So let me, let me do it again. Uh, maybe, Maybe you're okay. I click, so there is this J box. I close it, and now we can see here the output that R is doing. Sorry, that R is producing. Okay, so how does it do it? Let's start by this part is simply this section where we are, we are showing the time. It is automatically updating every second. Uh, this is just empty space. And then we define the button that activates the, the J box. Well, the J box element. Uh, now, th this code is not important. It's simply the code so that uh, this number uh, gets updated every second. So it, it does, that really doesn't matter. Here is a part that does matter of how we are sending data from R to, sorry, from JavaScript to R. So we, we do this, right? So whenever we click this button, so we define observe event uh, for this button with identifier show, we want R to execute this code. And what it is doing is simply defining uh, the arguments for this notice box that is going to be shown and the arguments will be the same. This text and the color of the box. So it sends the, the, this data from, from R to, no, sorry. This was from R to JavaScript. We define the same ID and the data being sent is this parameter for, for our notice box. And then, okay, 
So this is, this is sending data from R to JavaScript. We are sending these parameters. So what is JavaScript doing with such data? Uh, that code is over here. So as we saw, we have to do the, you have to, we have to use this, uh, this function. And, and now it's recognizing the same ID of, of, of this, say of this event, of this message. Now, given the parameters for this box, it is defining uh, this over here. It is adding to, to this set of parameters uh, what we want to do when this message gets closed. So it is defined over here, right? Message is, the, is this JSON object. So it is adding to, to such JSON object. Uh, this extra, this instructions, this function. So what it is doing is, uh, well, first it defines an input uh, with a ID, now it is close, and then it is changing the value of such input. And over here simply it is uh, the JavaScript way to obtain this number. So, we are defining over here that when this message uh, gets closed, uh, we want that this, uh, sorry, that this shiny input with this ID, uh, it updates its value to the current uh, number in seconds that we have, that it, is, that it is being displayed in this section. And then now that it has uh, this, parameters, this JSON object for our JBox. Simply let's add such parameters to a JBox um, and show it to the user. So. Let's see, one, one question if I may, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but the uh, uh, notice close uh, input, that's, that's coming strictly from JavaScript, right? That's the only place it's defined and kind of action is happening on the, on that, that input. It's just in the shiny set input values, notice close. That's the only place that it's, it's coming from. Uh, so it's yeah. kind of, I was trying to reason about like the observe event on the server side, like what, you know, what, what, what is shiny looking at? Is it only just, you know, an ob, kind of like an input value that, that uh, the JavaScript's creating? Yes, it is exactly doing that. We, we never define this input, this input with this ID. We don't define it in the user interface. Uh, we will, well, you, via the usual, via the usual R code, but we do, do use such input as we can see over here in the in the in the server so it is happening right that when this input changes value as we are doing over here because we're updating the value of such input so that it takes this number when when such input gets updated it simply prints such value over here in the r console that there, there is over here in this section So I click again and I close this message and it prints the value over here. Awesome, thank, thank you so much. I was, that's what I thought was happening, but wanted to make sure I was on the right path. Thanks. Yeah, so that's basically it. Maybe like as, as a last comment, maybe we can try to understand what's happening with this app because because it, it it isn't really only sending data from from JavaScript to R. We are also sending data from R to JavaScript, right? When we're when we are defining sorry when, when we are using this this code. So it, it works as, as follow as follows. We start uh, over here with the button. Let, let me run it again. Uh, sorry. Okay. It starts with this button and it says whenever uh, the value of this button uh, changes, so when I click on it, the value associated with that button will be sent to a server. And then there is some instructions for R 
to use that value and then send some data to JavaScript. The such part is over here. We are simply sending uh, the text for the box and its color. We, we, we aren't even using the value of this button. Okay, so now it sends these parameters for our box, text and color. And now what does Shiny do with that, with that, with that data that it is being sent with this list? We can see here, uh, the identifier is sent notice. So we, in this section, we look at what JavaScript is doing. We send the parameters. So what JavaScript does is to such parameters, it adds uh, this instruction no? of what JavaScript has to do whenever such JBox gets closed or, or it closes automatically. And we'll, we, we'll really show what it does. Uh, well, first it adds, it adds this function and then it displays such notice, such box. And then when such box uh, it's closed, it executes some code that we have set over here. That the input with this ID gets updated, sorry, its value gets updated to the current number over here. And now that such input has changed, has yes, has changed, we can do something with with R uh, after such input value has updated. And so such input value is being sent now from the client to the server from JavaScript to R. And the only thing what we are doing over here now, now that we have such data is printing it in the console. So it goes all the way around. Uh, and yeah, that, that's it really. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's quite interesting. So from from that example, it seems that the um, you, you pass data from JavaScript to R and whatever you pass into R must be bound into the input list in 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 shiny at least if if you're using a set input value i was having a um i was having a look through the um the source code for shiny and trying to work out what happens when an output elements is invalidated or when it needs to be regenerated in R, what methods it actually calls inside Shiny and whether it's using this, you know, set custom message kind of code and things like that. It's, it's, the source code's so huge for Shiny that I just couldn't find it. Um, but it's very interesting. Thanks, thanks for taking us through it. Um, do you, um, have, have you ever written any kind of custom JavaScript stuff uh, for a for a shiny app, Lucio? Um, for a shiny app, um, not really, but I, I was actually expecting to to showcase uh, my the HTML widget that I created uh, because I think it was discussed in the in the last section. That if there was extra time, that we could share what what we what we had done with the with the knowledge gained from the from the last chapters. Right. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I mean, you you're welcome to post stuff in the the Slack channel if you want to um, discuss stuff further. Um, guys, do, do you have any questions? I don't have a direct question, but I did add a link to a comment Lucio made a couple of days ago. Lucio, if you want to expand on, on your statement, uh, Maya Gaines uh, jumped in uh, to the message thread. Um, we were tagging the uh, just a little JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript goes a long way. And 
I do encourage watching it because the example that Lucio is covering, Maya also relates to, and the the relationship between JavaScript to R and then R back to JavaScript. Uh, it's a it's a tricky tricky handshake. Um, Lucy, you did a great job in in conveying it, um, giving an alternative uh, person to watch as well. Do you want to expand on that on that video at all, or or your comment said that it was partly the reason uh, for you to jump into this book club? Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I I don't really remember fully the content. I I think that yeah, as you mentioned, it it mostly covered. Uh, what we just saw over here, uh, but but I mean my motivation also came not just from that talk, but from from I I don't know how to pronounce her name Maya Maya, yeah from her specifically because uh, her and I think this person Garrick I didn't blue I don't know how it it's said uh, it's the people from R that I have seen the most explore how to combine R and JavaScript. And that is something that I really like to do. So in a way, I, I admire them. Cool. Right then. OK, well, um, uh, I think we ought to call it a, a day. Well, a a day for me, but uh, <laughs> you've got the rest of your fucking days to do. Um, anyway, um, right, uh, thanks ever so much for doing that, Lucy. That was a really good um, presentation. Um, and uh, next week, I won't be here, um, but uh, Ryan is going to be taking us through the chapter 12, which I, I haven't read in full, but does seem quite a long chapter. So if you feel that it ought to be split over two weeks, that's that's really not an issue. Don't try and stuff too much content into a single week. Um, but if you know, if you having looked through it, feel that there's stuff that could easily be trimmed out, then by all means, just present the most interesting parts of it. Um, yes, I won't be here next week, but I will watch online. Um, so, yes, brilliant. Thanks everyone for coming along and um, enjoy next week's uh, session. Um, cool. Right. Thanks a lot. I'll see you all later. Thanks, Lucio, for the great presentation.